Welcome back to the Word on Fire Institute lecture series, The Idolatry of Identity, Progressive Wokist Ideology, and the Catholic Response. Up to this point, we've examined how progressivism appropriates and distorts elements of classical liberalism, libertarianism, utilitarianism, postmodernism, and, and most recently, post-colonialism. It is important to note that this is not an exhaustive list of all the ideologies progressivism has appropriated. Indeed, there is no limiting principle to the progressive Frankenstein's capacity and desire to gobble up any idea or theory that will make it more powerful. A complete list of all the ideological scraps pressed into progressive service would also include Marxism, sundry forms of socialism, the socio-political theory of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Jacobinism, romanticism, a potpourri of critical theories, for example, critical race theory, queer theory, feminist theory, and a, and a dash of uh, Nietzschean will to power nihilism for good measure. Indeed, seeking to provide a comprehensive summary of progressivism is like trying to get a hundred unruly children to look in the same way and keep their eyes open long enough to take a decent picture. Good luck. With that disclaimer in place, however, here is my hazarding of such a summary. Progressive ideology is defined by the following six features. One, experientially based epistemologies. Progressivism tends to derive its ideas from the self-reported lived experiences of individuals deemed to be representative of a politically favored group. Often the ideology will assert that rational objectivity and epistemic universality, that is, the belief that all human beings can potentially apprehend and assent to a shared truth, are social constructs employed to oppress the group for whom progressivism is advocating. This epistemology is evident in the claim, we are speaking our truth. Progressivism also holds that any dissenting member of an identity group, for example, a person of color who disagrees with some or all tenets of critical race theory, are not real or authentic representatives because they have adopted the oppressor's point of view. Moreover, since experience cannot be falsified, that is, there's, there's no way to ascertain whether an experience is true using experience alone, those outside the identity group have no rational mechanism to challenge the ideology's epistemic content. Two, group control of language and logic. Precisely because progressive ideology tends to eschew rational objectivity and by extension a, a commitment to universally intelligible language, it tries to advance its goals by imbuing words and statements with whatever meaning the identity group believes will best advance their political interests. The ideology's creation of in-group language intended for out-group consumption often results in contradictory claims. For example, colorblindness is racism, property destruction is peaceful protest, and all lives matter is bigotry, or as anti-racism activist Ibram X. Kendi has asserted, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination, which is another way of saying that racial discrimination is both unjust and just at the same time. Three, a tendency to generate neologisms. Relatedly, progressive ideology frequently generates words and slogans whose meaning is entirely dependent on the will of the identity group, yet whose moral authority must be respected by those outside the group. Examples include love is love, non-binary, misgendering, unconscious bias, mansplaining, cultural appropriation, believe all women, white male privilege, patriarchy, heteronormativity, cisnormativity, dead naming, silence is violence, microaggression, Latinx, equity, birthing person, allyship, whitewash, queer baiting, pansexual, toxic masculinity, intersectionality, and gender affirming care, among many others. Questioning the meaning, coherence, and or selective applicability of these terms uh, can and will generate the charge that one has a phobia or is motivated by hate. Four, a conflation of opposing viewpoints with harm and danger. Again, because progressivism tends to reject 
rational standards of truth, falsity, and coherence as tools for advancing their positions, the only principle to which they can appeal to criticize competing points of view and advance their own is safety. Progressivism thus frequently tags speech with which it disagrees as unsafe, which in turn generates a moral imperative to be protected from that speech, which means silencing the speaker or speakers. Five, focused on attaining power. Progressive ideology tends to reduce all forms of knowledge into assessments of power dimensions, specifically construed as identifying A, which group is most dominant in society, and B, how to oust that group from its socio-political perch. In this sense, progressivism is mercantilist in nature. It asserts there is a fixed, limited supply of power in the world, and if, and if one group has it, that means it has been stolen from a, another group. It also tends to interpret all empirically observable inequalities among groups, as, as they define group, as ipso facto evidence of oppression. Moreover, the existence of people who question the causal relationship between oppression and inequality is for progressivism itself dispositive evidence that the system is oppressive. Six, offering catch-22 solutions. Finally, progressivism tends to offer outgroup individuals a, a catch-22 scenario. Either A, submit to our demands and thereby admit that you are in fact an oppressor, or B, refuse our demands and thereby reveal that you are in fact an oppressor because your refusal to admit guilt proves that you are an agent of the oppressive system. The two options are redolent of the late medieval practice of witch testing. If the accused woman cast into the water by the mob submitted and drowned, she was no longer a communal threat and thus could be counted on as on our side. If, however, she struggled and survived, her very resistance proved she was on their side and needed to be punished for it. Hearing this summary, it may be difficult to comprehend how such a hodgepodge of disparate assertions could ever fit a unified body of beliefs that could be accurately described as a single ideology. To be sure, these elements by themselves, like, like fragments of different puzzles tossed together into a single box, cannot and will not fit together on their own. They need a binding agent, a, a political glue to hold them all together. That glue takes the name of the final characteristic of progressivism, intersectionality. Intersectionality recognizing overlapping interests among different identity groups. So for example, a feminist racialist identity group could find common cause with, that is to say, uh, intersect with a feminist sexual orientation identity group on the issue of, say, uh, access to abortion or free medical care or a federal employment law, etc. However, it is important to keep in mind, given uh, progressivism's underlying particularist epistemology, that any agreement among identity groups is accidental, accidental in nature, meaning it just happens to be the case that the groups have a common interest. There cannot be shared rational agreement on anything because there's no such thing as universally shared rationality. This framework, however, it immediately generates problems. How do identity groups handle situations in which there is a, a conflict of group interests? For example, say one identity group believes that its members should get X number of seats on a corporate board, while another identity group believes that its members should have the same number or more. Since negotiation based on rationally objective principles is, is not an option, what is the alternative to physical confrontation? Intersectionality lights the way forward. Competing identity groups can pause the fighting among themselves and turn their opprobrium to a common oppressor. If the cooperative of identity groups can take out this shared threat to their interests, that will then open more opportunities, for example, more seats on corporate boards, for all the members of the heretofore competing identity groups. As a thought experiment, let's say that this intersectional strategy of uniting against a common enemy works. 
weakened and eventually toppled by being attacked from all sides at once, the hegemonic oppressor falls in a great cloud of dust, leaving an entirely open field for the intersectional allies to occupy. But what comes next for progressive ideology? To use a recent real world example, and I, I wanna emphasize this actually happened. Let's say that a push for equity leads a world famous Chicago museum to fire all of its white docents because there were just too many of them, which was allegedly preventing other identity groups from serving as docents. And, and, and if you think that it's racist to fire people only based upon the color of their skin, uh, progressivism would like to have a word with you in private. This would be an intersectional win for all non-white identity groups. Congratulations. But what comes next? Who gets those spots that were formerly occupied by the oppressors? One option is to ensure that there is a, a proportional representation of each identity group in the new batch of docents. So say there are 100 possible docent spots in the museum. After adjusting for historical guilt, meaning, meaning whites would not get any proportional representation in the interest of racial atonement, all recently unoccupied docent spots would be filled according to the proportional representation of each identity group in the United States population. Problem solved. Good work, intersectionality. But wait, there's a new problem. Another identity group suddenly shows up, one that, one that hadn't been there in the first divvying up of docent slots. And they demand that they get access to some of those spots too. In fact, this new group not only claims identity status based on race, but does so on the basis of sexual orientation and ethnicity as well. This new identity group also argues that proportional representation is a form of white colonial patriarchal thinking. The truly just way to distribute the docent spots is thus not to divide them according to racial proportionality in the U.S. population. Besides, borders are imperial constructs, and therefore we should think of global populations rather than national populations, but rather according to the metrics of diversity, equity, and inclusion. This metric weighs units of oppression, which means that the more oppressed identity group one has, one can claim under one's name, the more right to resources one has, including docent positions. Well, we agree, chimes in another identity group as they enter into the intersectional negotiation safe space. We represent not only a racial identity group and a sexual identity group and an ethnicity identity group, but also a trans identity group. It is thus only just that we get the spots we want and determine who gets the other spots. Not so fast, chimes in another group, strutting into the center. You are all having this argument on stolen land, which rightly belonged to our ancestors and thus now rightly belongs to us. We therefore own the museum that was built on our land and all of the labor positions within the museum and therefore all the docent positions as well. We get to decide. Oh no, you don't, thunders another group repelling from above. Your ancestors actually stole this land from our ancestors who were the first ones to cross the continent, the land bridge. All of this belongs to us. We are the rightful owners of this land, this museum, these labor positions, and the proprietary rights to name and unnamed docents as we see fit. Now hand over those name tags and lanyards nice and slow. Silence all of you, comes another voice emerging from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Shame, shame. We are the multi-spirited community and we represent the wounded planet and all of her life, which all of you are guilty of oppressing with every filthy exhalation from your carbon polluted lungs. Out, all of you, and leave the docent positions to us so we can return them to the earth in reparation for your sins. Uh, excuse me, descends a gentle yet unquestionably authoritative voice from above. Uh, I couldn't help but notice this heated discussion you're having. And well, the thing is, is, I created the earth and everything on it, including all of you. So as far as I can tell, butt out, God, you patriarchal oppressive hegemon, rises a uniform coerce from below. Who asked you? Okay, that, that, that last part was a joke, kind of. But the rest of this scenario, as absurd as it may sound, is actually deadly serious. It is intersectional thinking taken to its logical endpoint. 
Once a common enemy is removed, the problem of dominance or oppression, it doesn't just go away. It just gets shifted to a new set of players in a game that everyone who is committed to playing identity politics cannot not play and yet can also never win because the logic of intersectionality permits a limitless permutation of identity groups, each with equal authority to claim that the interests of their group trump all the others because they say so. In the end, the only alternative left to settle disputes among identity groups is thus the old fashioned one, the threat of violence and ultimately violence itself. The shadow side of diversity, equity, and inclusion, in other words, is destruction, elimination, and implosion. It is a fitting mantra for an ideology that promises peace by intentionally and systematically pitting human beings against each other. The next three lectures will turn from analysis and critique of progressivism's ideological influences to a constructive response that draws on the rich resources of the Catholic social thought tradition. See you next time.